And okay, so for everybody who's sitting in on this, let, let's just kind of lay the groundwork. Um, for those of you who don't know Kelly McKay, we're going to introduce him in just a second, as well as myself, Pete Ramsey, because I think Kelly's going to put this over on his, and I'm going to put it on mine. And we're interviewing for a third person, and, and, and we think we've got a really good content, uh, uh, candidate. But here's what we're trying to do, okay? How do we take and get past all of the advertising, flashy, um, over-the-top garbage that's out there, cut through the clutter, and, it, and, and make it real? Okay, real talk about this industry, real talk about running this running a business in this industry, real talk about, you know, what it's like to be under the house, in the attic, on the road, get the cuts, you know, all of the scars, all everything that comes with that, instead of these glory blowing wind up your skirt scenarios that if you take this course, you're going to be, you know, so successful, et cetera. So you can be like me, so, 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 so. And we're not attacking anybody, but the point is, Things are never what they appear. And so if that's a little bit of what we're talking about. So let's talk HVAC talk and let's make it real. So let's start off with Kelly McKay talking a little bit. About what is it? What, tell us about you, Kelly. And, you know, what is it that you bring to the table for these conversations? Sure. And uh, I know what it is, but for, for the sake of those who don't. I feel like some of the stuff that you just said, quite possibly, I could fall into that bucket because I do have courses that I sell and I've got memberships and stuff. Um, but it's it, it comes from a place of genuine, heartfelt. I just want to help people because, you know, and I joined the business. I got married in 1996. Most people know my story. I'm not going to go through my whole story, but um, I struggled in my business for many, many years and it was certain key areas of the business that I learned. And once I started learning those, things started to change for the better. And I finally wasn't in so much pain anymore. Not that I never experienced pain. You know, I, I just last year, I experienced pain. And that's <laughs> part of the business, right? There's nobody. I've heard a couple of people a say yeah. that, you know, uh, being in the HVAC industry is like, um, is like, uh, you know, it's like dog years. Like I've heard a couple of people say that um, this, the gal that's a partner with me in, in our, what we do in our coaching stuff. Um, she was saying that to me just today, actually. So there's a lot of truth to that. Like it's, it's, it can be difficult. Um, it doesn't have to be, but the inner battle that happens in your mind and the fear that we yeah. have surrounding each stage of the business growth. Right. And the lack of business acumen and the lack of management abilities and the lack of just structure, because we all know that the majority of HVAC businesses get started by being a technician. Um, yeah. The majority of them. I know there's some sales guys out there and there's, I was a technician. Right. Okay. This yeah. 20, 26 years in the business. Um, Wow. started wow. in 1996 i am <laughs> started in 1996 when i got married and so uh started my business 2008 and wound up actually selling it early this year just kind of fell into my lap i wasn't i had talked to a lawyer a couple of years previously about succession planning and i yeah. had gotten kind of started on the process but i hadn't taken it any step further but I just had an opportunity arise and I was, uh, I, I took it. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I, I like to help people get out of pain because it's long, you know, that you've heard that old phrase, it's lonely at the top. Well, whether you're at the top of your one man company or you've got a, you know, got a company with 20 people in it, it still can feel lonely if you don't meet with some like minded business owners that are going through the same things you're going through. And so yeah. I wanted to create something for those people. So there's a saying out there, those who can't do teach. What have you done? In a nutshell, yeah. have you yeah. done this? Or are you just talking to me? Here's yeah, no, I've 
absolutely done this. Um, for 14 <laughs> years, I ran a relatively successful business in a really, really tough market. Yeah. And yeah. so, um, <clears throat> I, I, there isn't a single thing, put it this way, you know, I've got um, multiple people reach out to me through either sometimes Facebook. I talk, was talking to a guy this morning through Messenger, sometimes e email, and sometimes through YouTube. And any single problem that's been presented to me by any of those people, there's not a single one that I haven't dealt with 10 times over. I'm not saying that to be like I'm on some pedestal. I'm not on a pedestal. I've just been there and done that. There's really nothing in the business that I haven't had happen. Like you could name anything and I could tell you an instance where it happened. Yeah, so, I, I think that's an like, admirable quality. And actually, we were talking about that before we hit record <clears throat> is um, how do you maintain that humility, but yet let everybody know? I know what the heck I'm talking about. I've been here, I've done this, right? Without hitting that level of I'm the expert, look at me, you too can be like me and you can have all of these bands and all this stuff. You hit the nail on the head. Well, I shouldn't say you hit a, a chord with me when you started your business in a tough market, probably because like me, you didn't understand what, it, what demographic research was about and competitive analysis and all yeah. this other stuff before you started. Right. So, but you did it regardless. And a lot of those guys that are, you know, braggarts and I do this and I do that. And in other industries, not just ours. And guys, oh, yeah. for the most part, yeah. a lot of the guys out there, <laughs> teachers are really good. So we're, we're not targeting anybody. This is just a generality. Um, yeah. I love that humility and down to earth. And you were a tech and you've got the cuts and the scars and the bruises. And, you know, even big shot um, Ken Goodrich, he called me one day and, and he said that. He said, Pete, you're like me and that you've got the scars on your back. And that is what I see in you, right, as well. And so th that's the thing. Those who've been there and, you know, and dealt with all these problems. Oh, yeah. I noticed that your focus has shifted over into the business management and all of the different things that are creating these pains. And a lot of us that are less experienced may be focused. Yeah, but all I need is customers. Yeah, but, you know, I just need somebody to manage this. I just, they think they kind of understand, but you've gotten over that and you're, you're, you're actually calling that stuff out and focus on it. Your conversation seems to, 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 to focus around that. And so um, just an observation. Yeah. Um, because that was a huge pain, <clears throat> pain point for me. Um, I didn't, you know, I don't understand. I never understand how to, how to delegate things properly. I never understood how to lead people. And so as my progression grew, because that's one thing that I can tell any business owner in any industry is if you don't grow yourself, you're not going to grow your company. You've got to like, and I, I learned that probably four or five, six years into my business. And so really, I was really only doing what I was, should have been doing the whole time from years like eight to 14. Yeah. I so it's really only half the time did I actually become a business owner. Um, and I wish I would have, you know, had some of those realizations earlier because I know that, and I paid a lot of money for coaching myself because that was, that was, a, I always say like, I broke the seal. Like it's like drinking beer and I don't drink, but, but I understand that when you break the seal and you go use a restroom, like it's over for the rest of the night, like you're going to be, yeah. you're going to be pissing like every 10 minutes. Right. So I when you break the seal night. on spending money to get your education. Yeah. Um, I learned that relatively, not very early. Like there's, there's people out there today that are learning this far early, far sooner. They're realizing the value of asking questions and, and looking for answers way faster than I was. There's a lot of smart people out there that are, that are doing it way, way, way faster than what I did. So, sure. Sure. So um, real quick intro for, intro for Pete. I forgot to mention just real quick background because I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. We can move into more <laughs> deeper things, but you kind of want to know who's who's talking to you. Yeah. It, it, we're doing HAC talk and okay, you know what you're talking about. And clearly you do. You know, you, you start in the trenches, you work your way up, you realize what's important 
to the point where that's what you're focused on today. And my journey was not too different, but it was different. And so I focused on other areas of the business. Uh, but they're both, I think, equally important. And so for me, I joined the Army straight out of high school. And they sent me to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and trained me as a heating and air conditioning engineer, is what they call us. And um, went through that, became a technician, um, did uh, work my way through a couple of companies, got enough experience, and I started my business at the age of like 26 years old, I think I was, there about, it's been a while. And I owned a business for about 10 years, and I, and I sold that. So going from just me to, we had, you know, we weren't that big. Uh, I was in a bad market too. I think I had 14 employees at my largest and we really grew too fast during that time. So, you know, you had to pull back and you know, sure. wait and catch up for that. So went have through a, that. I have a couple and, of bad hires mixed in there. Well, that Yeah, but yeah. You're, what I realized too was, you know how you, uh, you have a team, right? You got a pair of installers and you got to keep, that's your, that's, that's your profit center. Or that's your, I used to call it queen bee. That's your queen bee. And you know, she's making, she's making the big bucks, but you got to keep her busy. You got to keep her at capacity. So mm -hmm. while your service techs, they're certainly profit centers as well. They become a really valuable lead generator. So these, the, in proportion to your install team, there's these techs and then there's maintenance and, you know, and, and, and so once you've built fully developed this team, that's all that capacity and balance. Now you start to add a second team on. And so this becomes a right. burden for that. And so that's that dip. And, you know, it's the yeah, million, it's, million dollar mark, they say. Yeah. It hurts. You, you go through it. And if you don't know how to measure these things, you're like, mm -hmm. where's my money going? What, you know, what's changed? I'm, you yeah. know, I'm charging the same thing, right? It, it That's why, you know, I, I think today's uh, software that, you know, when, when I did it, we had, uh, the bookkeeping, we had, it was DOS based. It, we didn't have really Windows based stuff. And when they did, it came out with QuickBooks, which was terrible back then. And so, you know, there was a big learning curve for us. Um, so my success came at maintaining capacity through the marketing side. And I, and I know those of you guys who know me, um, my grandfather was a commercial artist. He free painted, freehand brush stroke, all this stuff. And he, and he was training me and and my dad was in the business and those two fought like cats and dogs. But I learned a whole lot about that side. And I decided not to go in business with them, you know, after, after leaving the army. So I, I stayed heating and air and it kind of went from there. But my passion for that, the psychology, the mindset, a lot of stuff that I know, Kelly, you're, you're, you're into and you understand very well is what shaped me. But what really helped me is I too went to some of those training courses. Kelly, now there were different structures back then because I'm old. I started 1982. This is 2022. So I'm coming up on 40 years. And at age 46, that's pretty good, right? That's yeah. So, so no, I was 18, so I'm 58 now. So, you know, a lot of years past, I've seen a lot of things. and But, but I learned directly under Ron Smith. Um, yeah. He, you know, HVAC spells wealth and you know all that mm -hmm. stuff back back when he was really active and my gosh what a change that did our business I remember we won awards and we were selling that even in that crappy market we did so well so yeah. that people side of the business right the marketing side and the people side and all those processes that's what I really love but I was not as good as you are on the management and, and understanding that part we struggled with our numbers. I, I didn't get a lot of that straight, even after 10 years. Yeah. I did, I did take other classes, but my passion was on this other side, you know, and sometimes. Sure. You know, sure. So, but, you know, growth comes from pain and setbacks and mistakes and failings. You know, not every, you don't just go out there and become a millionaire, HVAC millionaire, pun intended. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, by taking some class, right? You got to, you, you got to have the setbacks, you know? Or, yeah. Or um, somebody else's. I, I, you know, I got lucky. I, I found there was a class that um, there was a old guy. I think he's still he's still helping people. His name's Bill Ligon. He's got to be in his nineties, and um, he 
I went to a class, I was a ream dealer and they offered a class and it was like in Oklahoma. It was, I know I had to drive to go to the class. And so I drove, me and my wife went down there and, um, it was like a two day class. And, and, uh, for whatever reason, this guy really took me under his wing a little bit. Like he didn't like mentor me for, you know, for months and months and months with of no charge or anything like that. I, I had purchased some other products. I, cause I actually went to a different class of his, um, cause he was selling, um, maintenance agreement, uh, maintenance agreement, basically like structure forms, forms, you know, um, <clears throat> and that came with, with a flat rate book. So it was maintenance agreements and flat rate pricing. Um, but those, these was the, the old printable version. So it was like 352 pages or something, you know? Sure. Yeah. Uh, we had those. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and it was made by, um, you're talking about, you know, Ron Smith back in the day. Well, this was, um, what Callahan Roach was it? No, he, it's Aptora, the same guy who makes Aptora. He calls himself Mr. HVAC. He had a YouTube channel. He hardly done anything on there. James liked her. James liked her. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I took a class and went ahead and purchased the flat rate system, purchased the, but that just sat on my shelf. You know, right. I, I took it back to the office. It sat on the shelf. It didn't do anything because I didn't use it. And then was fortunate enough to go to this class and it really that was what opened my eyes to this this idea of overhead and that my phone like now what I tell tell my clients and I tell people that I talk to all the time is that something that you have to understand is that the customer pays for everything sure. every single thing that your business has the customer's paying for yep. and that all has to be structured into your pricing. And when that's structured into your pricing, then all your overhead's taken care of. And that's what's going to fuel your growth. It's it's the number one thing that if people could just wrap their heads around it, um, to just, you know, Ellen Rohr, she's the advocate for our industry. And she worked probably alongside Ron Smith on some different projects, I'm sure, through the years. Um, and she owns Zoom Drain, which is a franchise, but she was involved in Clockworks, which was um, Jim Abrams and uh, Terry Nicholson and, you know, and Ellen. She was in right in there with Clockworks wow. with the, Mr. Sparky and uh, ben Benjamin Franklin Plumbing and One Hour. And so, but Ellen has been saying this for years, charge more just charge more, like keep <laughs> charge as much as you can because, and people, um, still don't like well, they, 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 I can, they I can post a yeah. video about pricing something, even though it's not, I'm not trying to use actual numbers. It's just hypothetical, but people want to argue with me about the pricing, but, or using the structure that I'm, that I'm trying to teach. And it's, the number one thing that can change any business is to just raise your prices. That's like the number one thing for any business that, that, that does any kind of business anywhere um, yeah. will make the biggest impact. Now, once now you can't just, you know, continue to raise your prices because eventually there, there will be a ceiling. People will start telling, you no. Um, but if people would just start raising their prices, they would, they, they would dig themselves out of, out of a hole a lot of times. And, and it would give them some breathing room to actually invest in their education from that point. Right. And so I got lucky enough that somebody showed me that I raised my prices. I started offering options, the simplest stuff. And then what do you know, we started to grow and I was able to pay back like $60,000 worth of IRS debt and pull myself out of this hole that I had dug and that's that. That was the, the, when things changed. So going from where you were charging and going to what you ultimately raised your prices to, what was really holding you back? I mean, it's your mindset. And that's what <laughs> I was looking for. End of the day, I it's always the mindset. I think so, you know the answer to that. One. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the mindset. So you reminded me. I'm, I'm showing myself, and I'll say this really quickly. Back in the 90s, there were there were sitcoms, and, and one of the big ones was Cheers, and that was one of my favorite ones. Yeah. And 
there was a restaurant, I think it was upstairs or downstairs, and the owner, they, that particular episode was he was going out of business. And they were like, wow, we love you. We eat there every day. The place is full. And he says, you know, he says, well, we just, uh, we, we can't make ends meet. And and it, it came down to the price of a hamburger and whatever he's charging, let's say it was two fifty or something way back then. And um, he says, well, would you pay $3? And I go, yeah, you know, of course. He said, well, would you pay three fifty? Well, yeah, of course. Well, would you pay five dollars? Like, whoa, no, that's not right. <laughs> but it was showing. Uh, it was just a sitcom, but it was showing what the market would bear. And in our business, I think we hold ourselves back exactly what you were saying because of our own limiting beliefs. And and yeah. that usually comes from our, you know, as a technician, you know, we know what those parts cost wholesale, and we know what the boss charged, and so we got to be ripping people off, right? And that's kind of what's going on in the subconscious mind until it's taught to and you mentioned some really good uh, awesome names and for me there was a lady and she's still affiliated of, you know an advocate of the business of the industry her name is ruth king ruth, ruth king, king uh -huh. and i said her class uh back around 1996 or seven right around the time i'd added linux as a line blew my mind blew, i mean you know and, and we broke that stuff down what you were talking about and uh it, it, not only did I learn it and it opened up my mind, she taught it in such an easy way that when I did, had my company meeting and I taught my team, all of a sudden, all of that started working. Instead of them being ashamed of the price, it's good. It's five hundred dollars. Sign here, you know. It was it, it's five hundred dollars. Good price. I, I, that, real quick, you know, yeah. something to really understand is that when I started my business and when you started your business, YouTube wasn't even hardly a thing. Like nobody was on YouTube all day, every day. There was no, like the internet was half of what it is today. Like we didn't even have, when I started, um, you know, I don't even think I had a touch screen phone. <clears throat> you know, I, I, you, I don't know how, what year it was exactly, but I could tell you in 1996, when I started, I started, went to work for my father-in-law and he had one of those brick phones and he was like, he was the only person I knew who carried a cell phone. <laughs> you know, so it wasn't a common thing. Um, so just having the resources it, and what really brought this up for me is like Ruth King, for instance, because we were selling some Goodman there for the last year, we sold some Goodman equipment and there there's there's even some free trainings on their dealer portal that she's partnered with goodman to to help contractors out there so there's all these extra resources out there as well that we didn't have when yeah. we were starting when we were starting the business it just it really wasn't there so facebook wasn't big back then you couldn't go on and ask a group hey what do i do in this situation like that that didn't exist so, so my business was during the 90s. Um, when I started my business, all I had was a beeper and uh, quarters. Yep. And you go to the pay phones. That were around. Pay phone. uh, I got my bag phone. And, and then I remember people saying, you've made it. You got your beeper. You got your bag <laughs> phone. <laughs> You're a success. Now. I'm serious. I, I really had that. And uh, oh, but yeah, yeah, we added, I, we added, because we had a facsimile, or they called it a fax line, dedicated for faxes. We added another telephone for dial-up internet. And it, when you, you go... Yeah, <laughs> dial-up, yeah. And make the connection, and America Online said, you've got mail. You know, they, we didn't have a website. I mean, so I went through all of that. And, yeah. But here's the crazy thing. That you have, you, you right. understand how to read a real map. Yeah, like I do. Map, yeah, we use maps. That's the only go. way you could find yeah. any houses. You had to you, read a map. Yeah, you, you actually had to read a map. Um, yeah. You know, we use maps. Go. Uh, I'm knowing Dallas when I was a tech. We use maps. Go. That was a really good book. But in, in they didn't have. They had another version in the Carolinas when I had my business. But yeah, you had to read a map. You had to. Um, it's a lot of stuff you had to do. You really had to be able to work well without much. We used the 800 megahertz handheld radios, and they could get anywhere in town. So we could get help, but everybody's radio was, you know, open to the same frequency. And so there wasn't a lot yeah. of privacy on there. So it's not like yeah. a cell phone. And I, I would say in 1996, 97, 
about 1998, I went to work for a different company and they had radios. So I'm familiar with radios. When, right. when you need help, you just hope that the, the senior tech was in his truck. Sure. You know, and I'd be like, I need help, you know. <laughs> so yeah. Wow, memories, yeah. memories, memories. But yeah. you know, we talked a lot about us and what, what got us to this point. Um, I think ultimately we definitely want to bounce back and forth from those times to, to these times for, for yeah. For all these guys that are out there, they're, you know, no matter where they are in their, you know, stage of progression, whether, you know, junior tech or just coming to the industry or they just started their business or, you know, maybe they're established and they're just looking for a little bit of, you know, like you said, it's lonely at the top. You're just having somebody, everybody says, boss, boss, what I do, what I do, who do you call it? Who do you get a little bit of feedback from? And one of the things, aren't you a member, don't you have like some uh, groups that you work with as well? Uh, yeah, we do like uh, HVAC millionaire coaching, HMC, I call it, or me and a business partner. So, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I'm a co founder. Yeah, you know? I, I we do a couple of mastermind groups as well, and mm -hmm. um, that's kind of cool too because I'm not taking the lead, they are, and so yeah. it's really cool. I've got my finger on the pulse a lot of times of all the problems that are going on, and yet, and you know what's you know what's crazy, Kelly is it's my lessons from back in the nineties. A lot of times still that relevant have to today. reintroduce today, right. And package it right. Yeah. It works. You know, it's like success principles. Like they're universal. They, they're never going to go away. You know, they work. And we had one, uh, it was mastermind called just, uh, it was, I think it was just last month. And they were talking about, you know, how do you prioritize calls? And there's programs for that, obviously, but, it sent me back to a book that was written in the 80s, and it was called The One Minute Manager. Do you remember that one? Yeah, I actually got it again and listened to it just a couple of months ago. I, I don't have the physical copy, but I've listened to it on Audible like twice. So, yeah, I had a physical copy, and it, and it had a quadrant. It was talking about how to prioritize things mm -hmm. on on what was urgent and what was important and the difference between the two and how to, you know, just little things like that. And we introduced that, um, you know, this is books that were written way back. And everyone's yeah. like, oh, you know, that's so cool. We hadn't heard of that one before. Where did that come from? You know, and that's what I'm saying. A lot of this stuff, we just look backwards and think, well, they're old. They don't know. But aren't the best self, I mean, you, you do a lot of personal development. Aren't the, some of the best self-help books or development books written way back in the day? Oh, and absolutely. About today? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, not that some of today's books aren't really relevant and really good. Um, <laughs> like, true. for instance, um, just a couple I just read. Um, he wrote uh, a book called Essentialism, Greg McCowan. And I didn't I didn't read that one, but his new book is Effortless. It's really good. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm trying to think of the other one that's really good that I've got the one thing. One thing. The one thing by um oh who is that by? On oh, my bookshelf over there. I can't read it. I can't remember his name. It's been a while since I've read that one. I need to read it again. But but still, the oldies but goodies, think and grow rich. That's one that I come back to over and over again. That's my sure. favorite one of my favorite books ever. Yeah. Uh, How to win friends and influence people. <clears throat> um one of my favorites is the success principles, um, how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Love that book. I come back to it um, every year or two, read it again. One of the things that I noticed a lot of business owners, that's really trendy. And, and you know, what, real, real quick, Pete. Yeah. You know, Think and Grow Rich was probably maybe my second or third book I'd ever read in my life at 34 or 35 years old. Wow. So I did not read at all. Yeah. But yeah. once I, I I got myself into pain and then I found a category that I really like was passionate over. And then I, when I implemented some things, my life started to work better. And so from there, it was just a case of, it's not that I didn't like to read. It's that I never found the right books to read. But we since do. then, like I've, I've got books all over my house. <clears throat> like <laughs> I read all yeah. the time. So. Yeah, it, it, it requires your ability to focus. And a lot of times, you know, when you're out there, and you're, you, you you can't get through dinner without thinking about, oh, my gosh, the job on Tuesday, what am I going to do, you know, or, 
or, you know, I should not have told that lady, you know, that we'd take that job, you know, whatever, all this different stuff. And uh, a lot of times it's hard to stay focused and being able to uh, train yourself to take that time away, you know, focus on something else and it being good for you at the same time. It, that's huge. For me, I mean, I, I, I started reading early, uh, not too early, because true story, I'm in the army. We're bored. Now we're all like 19 years old. A bunch of, you know, we, I think we just got deployed to go to Central America. And I had picked up a pocket dictionary. And um, I was sitting there flipping through it. And, and one of the, you know, we're, we have nothing to do. We're, it's the thing you do in the army a lot of times, just waiting. And I'm looking, I'm looking up words that I don't know just because in the military, they would, they used big words that we did. It wasn't part of my vocabulary. Yeah, you know, they didn't go to the grocery store. They went to the commiss the commissary. They didn't go to the store. They went to the post exchange. I'm like, you know, what what, what does that mean? You know, and so you start. Hey, with <clears throat> real quick, let me point this out: is that is actually that's like <clears throat> building a culture, kind of. So, because if you're on the military base, you call it a commissary, where all the civilian folk just call it a grocery store. It's yes. language, and yes. you can you you know people need to use this with their teams too. You don't yes. call it just a, a service contract or a maintenance agreement. You make up your own name yeah. that everybody on your team can associate with that's different than everybody else. So I just wanted to point that out. Right and, and, and if you reverse engineered it, it builds value in your customers' ears. Wow. Well, they, you know, they don't just do a maintenance yeah. agreement. They do the you know, super saving system program or whatever yeah. you call it. Yeah. So customers that's kind of point. Are man but, but what I had gotten out of this certificate. was a little different. That's, that's what inspired, you know, the words I didn't know. But one of my buddies comes up to me and says, hey, Pete, what you doing? And I said, oh, I'm looking up words I don't know. He goes, ask me one. And so what I would do is I'd look up a word I knew I didn't know, and I'd ask him, and he didn't know it either. And then here comes another guy, here comes another guy. Before you know it, we got about five of us around. And one of the guys' names, his name is Ty Bassham. We're friends to this day. He's in Oklahoma. That's why I was laughing. Yeah. We're friends all these years later. I would I would look up a word I didn't know. Or, you know, I would look up a word I didn't know. He goes, oh, yeah, that's like, and he would use it in the sentence. He couldn't define it. You know, the de definition is blah, blah, blah. He just said, oh, you know, like when you're going down the street and you did this, this, this and, and we all, nobody could get one past him. And I said, dude, I mean, just, it, it, came, it overcame me. How do you know yeah. this? He said, well, I read a lot. Yeah. That my my wife is like a borderline genius. She reads, she reads um, fiction, but she reads like nonstop. I mean, she probably reads, who knows? I can't even tell you. I'll bet she reads five, six books a week. Sure. Not joking. Like she reads anytime she's, sitting she's got a book in her hand like she uses a kindle so um but she's like that like you can any word that i don't know i can just ask her and she'll tell me what it means and i think we ought to clarify this to anybody listening this is no substitute for real life experience yeah you have got to have both am i right 100 percent yeah, I, I remember my dad, um, he was he was my inspiration for reading because that when my mind was blown, that story I just told, I remember my dad who knew everything. He was just constantly reading. But he yeah. had gotten into this research, he was self-taught, and he was doing all this work. And he would get emails from these people with doctorates and PhDs and just get titles with all these acronyms asking for his help. And, and these guys have done all the studies, they've read all the books. But this guy had the real life experience and that's where the value comes from too. And so, yeah, we need to understand all these concepts and everything else that we read. We need to, you know, exercise our minds and grow. But you know, those of you guys out there who you're, you're under the houses and you're in the annex and you're, you're making all the mistakes and you're getting better and better. There is no substitute for that. Uh, I think yeah. Pat Riley, he wrote a book. He said, do not underestimate the time you spent in the trenches because they will pay huge dividends later. So all those years as a helper and as a junior and, you know, junior installers, installer or junior tech and tech, um, breaking into sales and, 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 and building your way up through, through that, all those no's to get to the point. So all of that matters, but 
it's a lot easier, isn't it, Kelly, to learn from somebody else's mistakes? You get a point where you're like, let me just read oh, it. Completely. Again. Like, there's so many, you know, I've also heard that you're going to, you're going to pay for your education in mistakes or you're going to go out and buy it somewhere. Like, you, no matter what, there is no, there is no shortcut past paying for your education. You're going to pay for it one way or another. That's the, that's the truth. And it will always be the truth. And, and, um, but you can avoid a lot of stupid, really stupid mistakes just because you're not thinking properly. You're not thinking like a business owner. You're not evaluating, you know, one of the things that, um, I teach is, is, uh, real quick. I, you know, Napoleon Hill, one of my favorite quotes, every adversity brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage or every adversity, every failure, every heartbreak carries with it the seed of an equal or greater benefit. Yeah. You know, so every screw up, you get something out of it. You always get something out of it. And yeah, yeah but it's, it's a. Uh, but if you allow yourself, you can learn from somebody else's screw up by reading these books. And I, you just gave a wonderful example about all somebody had to do is bring your attention about adding that overhead because that's got to be built into the price. And I, I know I did, you said it better than I did, but I can relate it to from the time I was a technician. I'm a helper, and 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 we're we're I've got my black and Decker drill gun back in, back, yeah. back back when the you know, that was the cheapest thing you could get. Didn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had some pretty good forearms because all I had was nut drivers. You know, a little quarter yeah. five. Yeah. Three eights, you know, that you always kept in. But um, so I, I, I'd up to that. And so we're, I'm putting this unit together. He goes, hey, be careful. You don't grab the wrong screw. You're getting close to the coils there. And he's a lot of people will run a screw in and pierce the coils. And, and then now you really have a problem. I right. never forgot that. And in my, I've been in this industry for 40 years. And my, well, I've been on this side for, you know, a long, in all of my technical years, I never, ever, ever drilled a screw into a coil. But I remember, I, the day my helper, <laughs> I, I remember the day my helper did. What, what I'm saying is somebody, somebody, I learned from somebody else's experience. Yeah. That's what yeah. goes on. See, nobody ever told me that. So I didn't learn that until I experienced it myself as yes. a technician. And thankfully, the guy, you know, I was working for a company at the time and the, they came in and it was an antique old piece of junk, um, like one of those radiator coils. So repairing it was almost impossible, yeah. almost. Yeah. I mean, yeah. special solder, all this stuff. And thankfully, I, I went and I took off to go get the solder that I needed, the right, the right special solder. And then um, their sales guy came in, wound up selling them a new system because it was like a 35-year-old system. So thankfully, okay. I escaped that, but yeah. <laughs> I've, I've made that mistake, <laughs> so. There's, there's, I'm telling you, there's not hardly a mistake that I have not made. Oh, um, me too. Me when you too. do, and here's the thing too, is like, I've seen this a lot in my business uh, as an owner when you hire people. So I would hire people and they'd tell me, oh, I got five year experience. I've been installing for five years, or I've been in the field for 15 years or whatever. And you, they, you turn them loose and, you know, I didn't see those 15 years. I don't know what that experience actually looked like. But I can't be the only one who experienced this. I'm sure there's other people listening who have experienced this as well. But not all experiences created equal. So some people, their five years might have consisted of, you know, even in today's standards, like some of the most successful companies that are only running three to four calls a day. Well, I'm from the old school where we ran eight calls a day or nine and we worked till 11 o'clock at night. Yeah, so yeah. that that's a lot of damn experience. A lot. And that was my whole career. I mean, I did that for I did that for 22, 23 years. I did that. You know, I ran a lot of calls. I, I I've got a ton of experience. And every so often I'd hire somebody, they'd come in, tell me they got all this experience and they don't they didn't know diddly squat. You know, they couldn't get they couldn't get the the condenser fan motor off a shaft if their life depended on it. Yeah. You know, they, they had no, like it, Oh, it's not coming off. I'm gonna have to run to the supply house, get a new one. And I've, I've seen guys sitting in the supply house, you know, just last summer, they come in with their fan motor and they can't get the blade off. Like, dude, give me 10 minutes with that thing. I'll get it off one way or another. Um, yeah. Cause there's not, it's not even scuffed up and it's not even, yeah. it's, you know, it's not even, 
uh, rusty or anything. So anyhow, a lot of people they give up too quickly. It, it's like anything else. Once you beat your, it, it, like electrical is a really good example. I'll never forget. It was a Linux rooftop. It was bigger than a freaking bus. I mean, it was huge, and it wouldn't come online. They had all these white wires. This is back in the, everything was white. And it wouldn't come online. And I'm tracing, tracing, tracing. My boss called me, says, you need to get off that job. I said, I think I got it. But I'm, you know, I'm trying to figure this thing out. And it goes all the way back to a thermistor that was embedded in the suction line that would, took it offline. of some type of reset. I can't remember now. But basically, the superheat was too high, meaning the charger was too low. So the compressor offline. And that's all it was, undercharged a little bit. You know, so, but yeah. it's, you know, but the lessons that came with all of that effort and time and, Oh yes, yeah. shortcut future service calls because I've, I've been through that. You've been through that. You guys yeah. listening are going through that. You know, never underestimate your time in the trenches. Yeah, I'm not even talking time. about technical issues. I'm talking about mechanical issues. <laughs> like, it's a universal. Yeah, that's a universal truth. I mean, it's business too. Yeah, life keeps teaching you the same lesson until you learn the lesson and you adjust. Yeah. So that's what I was going to say earlier is I teach, I teach just this. It's a success principle. Um, feedback, feedback, everything is feedback. You are constantly, constantly receiving feedback from your body telling you, Hey, this is not right. You need to stop this. Hey, this is your, or from your boss or from your business. It's all feedback, you know? And so, but people want to pretend that they're not listening to it. They want to, La, 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 and act like it's not it doesn't exist or something um things aren't right and i get it because i've been there i am guilty yeah. because a lot of times i would i would have some feedback and i would know hey i need to do i didn't i need to make this decision i need to do this thing but it required like a really difficult conversation or something and you know i would put it off and then things would get better and then it would be like oh, okay it wasn't that bad right and then and that's just you can't do that like you have to because I, that creates a loss of trust with your team because when you enforce a policy or a rule or standards or values and those things get broken if you don't if you don't ensure that you're you're going to fix them anytime that that does happen then everyone else says well you know you didn't do anything when when bobby over there broke the rules you know, so it's like uh so i i've talked about this on a video before it's like broken window theory which is a concept that i'd never heard of but i read this book called the tipping point by malcolm gladwell and he talks about how this new york city subway system was losing millions of dollars a year there's graffiti all over the cars the train cars there's graffiti all over the walls people were jumping the turnstile so they weren't paying for yeah. for their their commute the ride. their ride and if somebody jumped one of the turnstiles then the next people would jump them too because because they saw that hey that guy just jumped him he didn't get in trouble and so that's broken window theory if you have a broken window in a building and it doesn't get repaired thieves eventually think that it's okay to just go ahead and let themselves in but if but they found if you fix that window if you fix it like yeah not you know <laughs> chop the, the the head off the snake right when it begins yeah. then then people will stay out of it. And it's just, so anyhow, they completely revamped um, just by making subtle changes. And this is the way business is too, is you can make little subtle changes that can drastically improve what your, you know, is business is capable of. Um, it doesn't have to take, you know, when they first started arresting people for jumping turnstiles, it would take them all day to book them. And so police officers didn't want to mess with that. You know, it, it just created a traffic jam. And so they figured out a system. Hey, here's how we can give people a ticket and and not take them down downtown. Just give them a ticket. And it only takes 10 minutes. Soon as they did that and they streamlined that process. Well, then they were able to they were able to um, stop people from not paying because it wasn't worth getting a ticket over. <laughs> and. 
And so when it came to the graffiti, graffiti automatically invited more crime into the subway. And so they start, they painted all the walls and painted all the cars. And anytime one of the subway cars got some more graffiti on it, they would pull it off of the track and they'd put it in a lot and it would sit there until it got repainted. And then they would, you know, back to its normal condition. Then they would put it back on. That way there was never any graffiti. And these little tiny subtle changes went from losing millions of dollars to earning millions of dollars for the New York, New York City subway system. They, while the while the cars were sitting in the lots, they would allow these graffiti artists to go in there. They would sneak in at night and they would spend one whole night getting a blank canvas. They'd paint it white. Then they'd come back the next night and get started on their art. And they would wait for them to finish. And once they finished, then they would go in and repaint the car again. And mm -hmm. it just it deflated the graffiti wow, arts yeah. because they just yeah. saw they spent all this time for nothing. It never even got made it to the public. And so they stopped and it just everything got better. So there's a lot of bad cultures out there, I'm sure, in a lot of businesses, um, not just HVAC, but but HVAC as well. Yeah, what's so your... You're really into the leadership role or area in discussing this because human nature creates these situations and we can look at what we consider, well, I never do that level people, but there's at every level in every category, your customers do this stuff to you. They figure out a way to beat your system. Your employees do it. You know, heck, if you're truthful with yourself, you do it. You try to cheat yourself out of you know, self-delusion and with, I'll, I'll work out tomorrow or, you know, there's all this different stuff yeah. that we do, but um, it's just human nature. And the quicker we come to realize that, come to grips with it. And I think it starts with us, right? Um, yeah. You get your own you, house in order. Just like you said, an illusion, you've got to be careful with that. That's something I realized. I've had a lot of time to reflect since the business sold. And I can see like so many things that I did wrong. And so, <laughs> and so um, one of those things is just having this fantasy that everybody's going to, you know, be an A player um, that every, not, not that I didn't have some A players and I had some B players that were working towards A players, had all of that. Um, but it's a fantasy to, to expect everybody to be A players. It's just a fantasy. You're going to have some B players. Of course, if you've got C players, get them off your team. If, if, if you can't find a different position for them on the bus, or if you can't, but trying to fix people, I spent many years trying to fix people. Um, and they would get better for a week or a month or two months. And then they go right back to their old behavior. And so that was, you know, if you get what I'm saying around fantasy, there's always like, put it this way. You have, uh, you have a, somebody who, <laughs> somebody who always goes the extra mile, always works hard, whatever. Well, if you start sending that person home early, what you'll find is there's going to be a natural balance. Like somebody who is maybe doesn't work quite as hard should step up to help fill that role. It's kind of like when, you do get rid of some people who aren't pro as productive as other people on your team, then they, the rest of the team will pick up the pace to fill the gap that is left by the person who left that countless owners have experienced that. And it's, there's like a balance happening at all times. You know, this is something that I'm just learning more about, like, Referring back to that same book, The One Minute Manager, it, it talked about two basic categories. There was skill set, you know, how much experience and ability does this person have? So that requires yeah. training to bring them up. And there was motivation. And so, you know, what does that take? And so some people you have to manage and, and you know, be on top of them. You know, step one, now go to this, now go to that. The other ones you need to, to coach, right? And, and still others, yeah. you just, you need to, motivate them and get get out of their way but they all need structure and so yes. one of the biggest if you guys if you're out there listening and you you're a one-man show in your business for yourself 
this is one of those things that I'm, I'm sure Kelly and I have ever talked about this, but I'm sure you can attest to it. Your thought is all I need is to get another technician who can work at my level and can step in and this will free me up to, you know, work on my business, not so much in my business, but on my business and everything else. And that's a great strategy. But the interesting thing is, the interesting thing is, number one, it it doesn't quite happen that way generally. I mean, we can get pretty lucky and, and get a, get a, a person with the right attitude and everything else. But no, they're not going to do. I never was able to find a technician that did things the way I wanted them done. I just I just couldn't find them. Uh, and and in my mind, they weren't as good as me. You know, maybe I was wrong, but that was the way I saw things. But you know, there were things that I did. There was a reason that I did it, and the ultimate, um, the the end result was that I had customers that would say, "Hey, Pete, you know, this guy's a nice guy, but you know, we'd really like to have you back." And you know, th there was a there there was something that I had established the customer liked. That's why they stayed with me. But because I did, I, I couldn't take all this stuff that was in my head. But I just automatically knew and did, and you know, could just look at something that I knew. And pass that into their to their heads. I just assume that they have since they had experience, they had the same experience, but they don't. They haven't run into the same headaches. They haven't overcome the same challenges. They've come overcome their own. There's probably some things that they could teach me on. So that if you're adding that second person, odds are you're not going to get them quite to that level. So you're going to have to settle a little bit and do some training, right? You know, hopefully you'll find the right, you know, shared values and in the, in, yeah. In the right. Uh, proper characteristics for that particular role that that are just necessary, right? Good, good work ethic, uh, attention to detail, and, you know, love technical stuff, whatever. But if you can give them, if, if you've taken the time, at least taken that structure and put it out and train them on that, they've got something to go by, and you can provide a little consistency to your customer experience as well as to the the equipment. Um, Let's let's say procedures, whether it's diagnostics, or maybe installation, or anything. So putting processes together, basically, right? Putting processes together that you know you've been through and everything else. But a lot there is some stuff out some there. Simplicity on the process too. If you make the process too complicated, it won't it will not be followed. Love that. You know, I I don't care how much training you do on it. It just will not happen. Um, they're going to develop their own nuances and stuff to go along with it. So it's like, if you can just get 80% of it right, you're doing really well, you know, and, and usually 80% of a process is going to get the job done, you know, in yeah, a proficient so, manner. So the guy I work for, he, you, you, if you call him and you didn't have these measurements. Yeah. Uh, written down you know he's saying you're right back and so you know what was your suction pressure what was your head pressure for example um it was yeah. good he said show me good on the gauge good does not exist on the set of gauges they don't exist on a multimeter what is the number you know okay you know you know what, yeah. is, the, what is the drop across the coil what you know what is the static pressure you oh know, my guys know that they need to have these numbers too when they call me Right. When they right. call me, they need to know. I'm going to ask, what's your second I pressure? hated that. I hated that. Um, I hated that, Kelly. And I remember, you know, I, I was a junior tech, and I said, you know what? I'm going to show the old fart something. I'm going to get all these numbers, and I'm going to throw it in his face and say, now tell me what's wrong. Smart aleck, right? <laughs> well, it was, when I did all these tests, I found the problem. It yeah. The problem, <laughs> yeah. Right? So he, you know. I didn't know what he was teaching me you know, at the time, but um, so. Yeah, but anyway, providing that structure uh, throughout your organization and what, uh, what what's good for the goose is good for the gander. You have to have your structure. Your technicians have to have theirs. The office staff has to have theirs. You hire a person go run my office for me. <laughs> I guess she's an office manager. She worked for multiple companies, and so I made her my office manager. And now I'm just going to go and uh, abdication. They call that abdication. abdication. <laughs> you just, you abdicate. You're not, that's not delegating. You abdicate, abdicate. You literally just say, here you go. Your problem now. I got to go yeah. do this. You know? <laughs> it doesn't work. I've, I've yeah. learned it doesn't work. They have, what gets measured gets, what, what gets managed, what gets measured gets managed. Yeah. So um, you still have yeah. to measure. 
You know, even if you delegate it and you delegate it properly, it still has to be managed, checked in on every so often um, to just to ensure that it's continuing to happen. Um, I learned this just a couple of weeks ago. And it's it, he said there's four types of it was Brian Tracy training. He's like, there's four types of of workers or whatever you want to call them, you know, employees or just people. Right. They're skilled plus engaged. It's kind of just what you were talking about. But then there's not skilled, but engaged. And then there's skilled and not engaged. And then there's not skilled and not engaged. Right. That's the four quadrants that was in that book. So exactly. Oh, is it in a book? Yeah. I, I, I don't well, I mean, it, it, it was worded a little differently, but uh, but that's exactly it. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. yeah. So, so you have to be able to navigate that. But you said what gets measured is what gets managed. And I remember even beyond that, uh, this is one of my mentors said, I can't remember who it was now, was what gets measured is what gets done. So if you do have employees and you're posting results and you, you know what you want to work, you know what you want to accomplish, if you measure those and post those, it tends to get done. So mm -hmm. uh, just one more addition to what you said uh, uh, a minute ago. So, Another thing that, that we we talk about and, and teach is when you get employees, like you have to know, of course, they know they should know what your mission and vision, mission, vision, values are, of course, because you share that as a company and you hope that they match those, of course, when you hire them so they so they can fit in. And um, but one of the things is that you <clears throat> I lost my train of thought. Where you completely lost the culture and, and, um, and, and yeah, and, where I was going with that is I'm trying to think. <laughs> that's okay. It happens okay. sometimes, you know. So um, j j I'll deviate from that just one second. So, guys, um, I hope that you kind of like what we're doing here. But what I think what we would like to do is we, we, we need a third person in here at least. Now, you know, I know we've got Gil over there at Uncensored. I think he's going to pop in occasionally as well, but he's pretty busy. But I, we, we've got we, we've got one candidate we're going to talk to and see if we can add him. But beneath these videos, I think I'm going to post these over on my YouTube channel, HVAC Greatness. And I know Kelly was wanting to post them over in his. We'll, 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 we'll have a little name and episode number, kind of like a podcast, I guess, but what we would like to do is maybe if you're in your comment section, bring up some topics that you'd like to, to discuss because a lot of times when you're so far down the road, you know, like old man Kelly here, uh, or even farther down the road, like grandpa Pete, <laughs> um, we assume that you know, and we kind of skim over things too fast and maybe we don't break it down and you're like, Oh, we'll back up. We'll, how does that work, right? Uh, and, and, and you do the same thing in, in, in areas that you've been through. So could we appeal to you to please you know, ask questions in the comments? And I'll make notes, he'll make notes, and we'll definitely do our best to incorporate these. But we would like to keep this, um, and I don't want to put words in Kelly's mouth, but in line with what you want to you want to know, right? Yeah, absolutely. We want it to be of value and of service. We so if it's certain topics, um, and I apologize for like losing my train of thought and some and and I know earlier when I was talking age, about, <laughs> well, I, I've been on I've been on the computer since ten thirty today, and it's almost nine thirty. It's is light here. Yeah. That's been a long day sitting in this chair, but um. Earlier when I was talking about, I'll, I'll find out the exact math because I can't remember it off the top of my head. But um, when I was talking about install efficiency, um, I'll, I'll definitely share things like that because that's stuff that once you know that number, you can start measuring it. And we just want to provide value. You know, it's yeah. just the bottom line. But we've yep. been in the trenches. Yep. Been in the trenches. Yep. Yeah, because, I mean, the last thing that you need is some condescending attitude. Like, all you have to do is this but guys, I'm going to tell you, if I tell you some of the stuff I screwed up, you'd laugh at me. I mean, I've I've made about every mistake in the book. 
more than once, right? Except for running a screw in the condenser pool. I never did that. But <laughs> no offense to I only did it once. So. But, <laughs> only <laughs> once, right? But all we're saying is, you know, it, it sometimes, you know, it, it, it takes one of your own to really, you know, that you can open up to and you, you can talk about these things and, 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 and communicate. Because, you know, I can ask Kelly, I know there's questions that I can ask him that I could never ask the rest of the world outside of our industry, um, for example, or outside of this area of expertise. He, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. And that, that's just, again, it's just experience. If you've been a technician for many years, you know, you know uh, what, uh, I don't know, raising a coal and an aluminum, an aluminum coal leak might, might entail, right? You, you know, mm -hmm. you pull your hair out, right? Versus copper, right? Uh, you know, somebody <laughs> who's never run into that, they, what, maybe that's not the best example. But the point is, you're talking yeah, yeah, about yeah. people who are from your world, been around a little bit longer. And you know what? We don't know everything, but, uh, I definitely don't know everything. I'm I'm not a, one of these super tech um, technical guys. I never have been. Yeah. I'm I'm about let's get the job done. Let's get it done right. right. Um, very anal about doing it as right as I can. So much so that like I'm not good on installs because it's going to take 12 hours for me to do an install because I want it to be perfect. Um, you know I I. I found a happy medium for the short time that I had to install, but um, there has to be a balance. You know, the, I see guys too in our industry that won't grow because people won't do it exactly like they want it done, which is what you were talking about earlier. Well, it doesn't have to be done like you did it. You know, they're going to do it their way and oh, it might be, uh, it might wind up better than yours. And that's an ego hit that people don't like, you know, it's, it's yes. a, it's a tough thing. It is. But, I was, I was going to say I, I lost a lot of money because I refused to drop certain uh, tasks out of my installations that my competition yeah. would because I just didn't want my name on that. And yeah. uh, I I did not understand my numbers as well as I thought I did. In fact, you know, you know we were talking about that. The, I think we're going to be talking to a numbers guy because, listen, I know a lot. I've got a lot of experience, but I guarantee if I don't know it, Kelly probably does. And if we get the right person uh, joining us, some out of the three, you know, we, we should, yeah. we should have, have something. We should yeah. be able to address just most of the stuff in our industry. Yeah. So, um, I'm not a numbers expert, obviously I'm not a numbers expert, but what I do know is industry standards and you can measure yourself, your own performance off of industry standards to know where you're at. And that's going to give you a good idea. As long as your, your financials are structured properly. Um, but I'm not the guru at that, you know, um, that's, that's where if we can get another partner in here, he's a guru at that and he can, he can help with the, with that, but making you know, sure that your books are structured properly. I, I love hearing your strengths and weaknesses because I have mine, but mine actually was, um, what I did is, is I went through the numbers and I just started figuring this stuff out myself. And when I was doing the pricing methods that they were teaching us, I started to see that they wouldn't work if equipment prices started, you know, costs started exceeding a certain percentage of the job as well as labor. And I started making this connection and I unknowingly discovered what they talk about now is GP per crew hour or crew day or man hour or man day. And I can mm -hmm. remember yeah. Yeah, I remember sitting in a class. I didn't know the right words. And the instructor was like, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, I knew exactly what I was talking about. I just didn't know. I didn't, I couldn't, we weren't speaking the same language. I, I figured it out. But, you know, these guys, right. they had the proper terminology and everything else. Yeah. So it's common, you know, not common sense, but it's, it, it, it's what we would call common sense. You know, being able to logically just understand, okay. You know, if you take yeah. it from here, it's got to go from somewhere. It's got to go somewhere. Um, and so, so um, we, you don't, guys, you don't have to know. Everything. You don't have to be a numbers guru to run an efficient, profitable business. Um, sure really no, straight. One thing, as opposed to getting your exact price perfect for your overhead and your sales, compared to raising your prices like, 
like you know, like uh, um, uh, Kelly mentioned on uh, on the prior thing, or uh, making some type of another adjustment, like filling your books a little bit better, staying at more capacity. You know, if you just look at capacity versus knowing your exact numbers, you can know your exact numbers and um, and say, oh, I got to raise my price, and all of a sudden your numbers drop because people were buying you, buying from you because you weren't selling, you were pricing, and I've seen that. So there's a lot of it. A lot of stuff. Lot of stuff. Yeah, cool. and I don't, yeah. Want to, I don't want that to be taken, what I said, to be taken out of context. I'm not saying you don't need to know your numbers. You do. Yes. Um, I'm just saying you don't have to be like a whiz guru at it. Um, once you learn just what you're looking for and how to measure it, and you, you still got to measure it, you know, <laughs> you still got to know. That. But um, yeah, brilliantly said, that's exactly what I do with new students is they're like, well, I need my numbers and everything else. Get, let's get your overhead in here, but let's just start with the KPIs. What is the industry? Doing? What is their, what, you know, what is their, uh, their overhead, you know, uh, a per percentage of total, total revenues and, you know, yeah. what is their markup on service? What is their markup on equipment replacement? What is their, you know, what, what are these, what are these GP numbers? Why not? Uh, let's, let's get you in line with the industry. And all of a sudden you, what you'll find out is you got a lot of weight room because you don't have near the overhead, right? And so you can actually pull back a little bit if you need to. But um, I don't start with digging into that either because to your point, Kelly, um, it's important. It's vitally important as you get bigger in, in, in you know, all these different departments and stuff like that. But for right now, you know, if you're, if you're one, two, three-man operation, um, there's other things you probably need to be focused on. Uh, oh, 100%. You need, you, need, you need to be focused on sales, period. Okay, yeah. Period. I mean, I hate to, you know, nobody wants to hear this. Nobody wants to hear how you have to go sell now that you own a business. <laughs> like, like I said earlier, like, what do you think your business survives off of? Are you, who are you, what are you pretending not to know? You know, what are you pretending not to know? Because <laughs> it's pretty common sense when you, when you, and I get it because I was there. I didn't think this way. I thought I'm my best. I'm best friends with all my customers. I'm gonna take care of them. I was good, fast, and cheap, you know. And um, you just can't be. You just can't be. We can be friends with everybody, but we're also gonna charge those friends when yeah. we do a job well done, you know. And that's that's how it has to be. There has to be a fair exchange. I've talked extensively about fair exchange. If you yeah. don't have a fair exchange you will begin to resent the business. You will begin to hate what you do for a living. Sure. And that may require what's called a paradigm shift or a little, you know, yeah. a little reality check. And uh, those are fun to have, by the way, because once you're on the other side, you're like, oh, it's liberating. I get it now, you know. Yeah. And, and, uh, Depending so, on how uh, deep the hole it is. That you're <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. So, so Kelly, we're, we're going to try to keep these between – 30 minutes in an hour and you know, we're, we're approaching, I, I don't know, about 45 minutes or so. Um, what would you say to kind of wrap this one down and um, let's start uh, figuring out what we're going to have the other ones and um, maybe start um, considering where we're going to go with this thing. Cause I, I, I think this, this is a, this is a vacuum that needs to be filled. And so, you know, we're just a couple of guys that have been there but we'll shoot straight. Um, what, what would yeah. you say beyond that? I'm not ever going to say anything's going to be easy in growing an HVAC business. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not, not ever going to pretend that it's not difficult and hard and you're going to have to grow as a person and change who you currently operate as to somebody different. That has to happen. You have to transform from a technician to a business owner. I've talked about this on my YouTube channel. Like you can't, you cannot be, you can't stay a technician and run a, a, a great business. Um, I just don't believe that's possible unless you have a lot of, you know, if you got an angel investor throwing millions of dollars at you to hire all the people to run the business for you, then you can continue to do a technician's role, but that never happens. So and I, I would, I would, I would uh, offer to soften that a little bit because, yeah. uh, depending on where you are, that may be intimidating. But having been through this, guys, you're going to change who you are anyway. It's just part of growing. Yeah. Whether you do it proactively or life just happens and it happens to you, 
but don't consider it like, you know, that's not who I am and I could never say, just, just take who you are and let's add some talents and some, some insights and, and grow that. And before you know it, people will think you changed. It's still you, but you've got all this. Yeah. Additional it's added. just the new, improved, more skilled you. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as adding adding that to it, I didn't do a very good job there of adding to it. I think it's just the case of um, Pete and I um, were were sewn from the same cloth, and we we uh, share similar values. We know what it's like. I've spent hundreds of hours in a crawl space, hundreds of hours in an attic, hundreds of overtime hours, thousands of overtime hours. Um, we just know what it's like. We know what it's like to grow from the from nothing, you know, from just barely starting out to growing and actually operating. And I think we had 17, 18, possibly even 19 employees at one time. Um, so but it was the same thing, you know, hired a couple, I hired some the numbers got out of whack, so we had to fix that. But there's there's so many things that that um we both would do differently. And so we like to share some of that on here because I think it'll be valuable to some of you guys that are trying to grow your business. You can maybe skip some of those things and, and uh, you know um, yeah, you're still going to have to, I still invite you to, you know, look into both of our programs um, what we have to offer because any any more of the education that you can get is going to be extremely beneficial to your growth and and progression in your business. So sure, and and we'll we'll talk about that more in depth as we go. Um, yeah. This is not all about selling us and everything else. About helping mm -hmm. you, but by the same token, I mean you know you got to eat too, right? You got to get charged for your services. So you know yeah, everybody. Absolutely. That. But I had a thought, and I, I lost it now, Kelly. You, you something that you said, and. I'm going to hand it back to you on a, what the heck was it? You said something. Um, so I'll catch you on the next one then. Don't you hate that? I hate that. Yeah. It happened to me yeah. this time too. So it happened. Yeah. So if we do this right, maybe um, you guys can pop it instead of, you know, you can drive and not have to look at our ugly faces and just maybe hear, hear us talking and, and uh, be a nice supplement to your podcasting. We'll put some playlists together on, on YouTube and, you know, who knows? Maybe it'll be a podcast one day, but uh, but for now, it's a resource. Take advantage. You know, fill in your drive time, every, every whatever way it works for you, and uh, we will see you. This was the intro, the introductory, a little bit about us and everything else. And uh, just know that you know we're here to help you. Ask questions in the comments, and uh, I guess uh, we'll uh, we'll see you guys on the next one. Sound good? We'll make money. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make money. All right, guys. We'll see you later. Yeah.